Thank you, Sandy. Uh, good morning, Mayor Hazy, uh, distinguished guests and fellow city shaping enthusiasts. It's a pleasure and an honor be, to be invited to speak with you today about the work that my colleagues and I at ACOM are doing on alternative funding and financing for transport and urban renewal. Oh, let's get that thing going. There we go. My presentation today will cover six topics and is drawn from two documents which you can download from the web if you want to explore these further. The first is Funding Australia's Future, and that is a document that was prepared following a uh, four-city tour that was sponsored by the U.S. Study Center at the University of Sydney and ACOM. And during that tour last year, we took 20 mayors and councillors from New South Wales cities, and we took them to four U.S. cities to look at urban renewal and transport projects that use this funding model. So there's a couple of really good examples in there from uh, Dallas, uh, Phoenix, Chicago, and um, Los Angeles that might be worth, uh, worth you having a look at. And then the Value Capture Roadmap, which was produced by ACOM and uh, Consult Australia. So what exactly is value capture funding and why are we not using it? Value capture, according to Wikipedia, internalizes the positive externalities of public investments, allowing public agencies to tax the direct beneficiaries, that's an important term, the direct beneficiaries, as Darren was saying, of the investment. In practice, this means that some portion of the tax, public tax revenue and property values that increase as a result of the public's investment in, say, a light rail project in Adelaide are pledged or hypothecated, that is a dirty word with Treasury officials, uh, to help pay for the project. In its purest form, value capture does not introduce a new tax, as Darren was saying. It simply captures some part of the uplift in tax revenues or land values that uh, above a business as usual revenue, which result from well-conceived and implemented public projects. A portion of this incremental revenue is then hypothecated into dedicated accounts to help fund the project. Unfortunately, the distinction on value, uh, of value capture and other funding methods has been lost or misunderstood in some quarters in Australia. And I'm going to have to disagree slightly with, with Darren on this issue, but this is good. I think we need to get the terms correct and, uh, and have a debate about these things. So Darren, Darren and I have been following each other around the country for the last couple of days. We should look at our presentations before we start this. <clears throat> For example, the Gold Coast Light Rail Project is sometimes described as using value capture because it applies this levy on households. In fact, I think an economist would tell you that any residential property that doesn't get a benefit of $110 really has lost $110 in value. So a broad-based value capture mechanism like the levy in the Gold Coast is not really, in my purest description, a value capture method. It's a, it's a levy. It's a funding method. There's nothing wrong with that. But what's happening in the dialogue today is that we're loading a lot of things into the definition of value capture, and we need to be careful because we'll spook the horses and we'll call value capture something that it's not, and as a result of that, some very worthwhile projects will get unfunded because they're mistaken for uh, uh, another tax. So one positive outcome of today's summit would be to agree to a common definition of what value capture is. And Darren and I will do that before the next speaking engagement. Value capture is not just a funding mechanism. It's also a decision-making tool that can be used by multidisciplinary teams and across public agencies to promote long-term sustainable growth and development. I'll give you an example of a great organizational model from my hometown in a minute. When properly applied, value capture is a holistic approach to infrastructure investment and economic development that recognizes that well-planned and delivered public investments, particularly transport infrastructure like you're contemplating here, generates increases in tax revenues and property values that can be shared to help close the widening funding gap we have in our communities. 
Research found, uh, has found in Western Australia uh, that public tax revenues at the federal, state, and local levels over 30 years from the introduction of the Mandura Rail Project in Perth increased those revenues by $506 million. And that's over 30 years, and it's across a broad spectrum. <clears throat> that was about 30% of the cost of that project. That was from doing nothing except building the train line. However, an alternative scenario with active urban intensification within 800 meters of the catchment of the stations would have increased this amount to $1.7 billion. That was 132% of the project's cost. Interestingly, a colleague of mine, Scott uh, Ellerant, who worked with uh, SKM here in, uh, in uh, Adelaide, did a, a uh, retrospective study on the Glen Ellic extension. And he found that the up, uplift in uh, employment and value added from the Glen Elg extension, if it could have been captured, all of it, would have paid for that extension. So there are documents in the government's hands now that show how this can be done in Adelaide on light rail. Some of these things don't, sit, don't hit the light of the day for reasons I don't fully understand. Value capture principles include concepts promoted and talked about earlier today. Smart growth, integrated in land use transport planning. They include making uh, more compact and higher density development around transport nodes, reduced reliance on private transport, more efficient use of existing and augmented infrastructure, reduced urban sprawl, and revitalized CBDs. So I'm just going to walk you through this model here. a community or a precinct that is being planned for, for uh, thank you, that's being planned. What happens is in the early phases, you need to get your funding and your financing models agreed and your, importantly, your public domain improvements identified. Once those improvements start being made, which are showed by, shown by these bars here, Revenue starts to increase above your base case. That revenue is the incremental revenue. If you've heard of tax increment financing, this is the tax increment financing model. This is where that tax increment revenue is coming from. That's where the name originates. In the US model, at the end of the funding period, which uh, we talked about the tenor of bonds that we have in Australia, the tenor of financing, Tenor of municipal bonds in the United States typically are 20 years, 21 years. So after that 21 or 30 year period, that full revenue stream then goes back to the original taxing authorities. So it becomes a way of forced investment in public projects. So how does it work? What's the next step we take? This is an example of a project that we've just completed uh, for Goodman. Goodman Limited is one of the largest industrial developers in the world. And on the right, on the right panel, you'll see the, the process that we go through in putting together a value capture study. The first issue is identifying the precinct, because we know from studies that within about a kilometer of a public in infrastructure investment, the impact on property values pretty much bleeds away. Most of that impact happens within a half kilometer or a kilometer of, of the development. In this particular study, which I'll go into a little bit more detail, we looked at the uplift that would happen if we put a railway station in the middle of that circle and allowed density to increase from a 2.1 floor space ratio to a four or a six floor space ratio. Now, I know that there has been some release of density controls in Adelaide, and I'm very sorry to hear that. That's a very sad thing because you have given away the bank on some of these issues, and you might have to see if you can take it back. What comes out of our model is pretty much the, um, the wedge-shaped diagram that I showed you a minute ago. You see there the dark, uh, the dark bars are the existing business-as-usual uh, revenue streams, and the orange bars are the increase in revenue. This is from a real project. And down in the bottom, the uh, net present value and the, un uh, the undiscounted uh, 
cash flows from that project. So we can look and we can see what the net impact of projects are over time by looking at land development and tax revenues. So that's the, that's the mystery which is not very uh, mysterious behind how it works. There's a number of different methods that can be used in a value capture program. And I've circled a couple of these things. And it's important to realize that value capture is a funding method, but not all me uh, funding methods involve value capture. Value capture programs leverage these benefits by an appropriate mix of density and scale to achieve agglomeration benefits. And that's where we get our productivity. And that's where we as a community and as a nation need to be moving. Now I'm going to look and pick on two of my favorite um, taxes in a little bit more detail. And what this graph shows is stamp duty as it's used in, the, uh, in other OECD countries. And what you, she, what you see there is the orange bar, Australia, uses stamp duty to generate about 24% of state revenue across the country. We use that more than any other country in the OECD except Korea. Unfortunately, it is the most ineffective method of taxation. It distorts markets, it uh, affects negatively home ownership, and treasuries at the state and federal level all agree that it's a bad tax. On the other hand, land tax is a much more efficient tax. It generates only 9% of state revenue, but that's because we don't really use it across the board in a broad way. If we did, we'd increase it by about 50%, because 50% of the properties, mainly principal residences, are exempted from it. Treasury tells us that if we were able to replace stamp duty with land tax, we'd have a 1.3% increase in our economic activity. And where we are today is, where, is that we need to find those small increments of change over time to help fund some of these projects. Now, what happens when you do projects well? Well, this slide here shows you the results of 120 case studies across the world on the impact of transport on land values. And so the circle there says 12% average, not too bad. This is the increment of change. This is the change above business as usual, not bad. But the thing that is striking is look at the minimum and maximum. You can do 150% positive or you can do 21% negative. Now why is that? I go back to what I said earlier. This is not just a funding model. It is a way of thinking about property. Light rail, thankfully, is equal best in terms of the amount of impact that it has on property value. But it requires a detailed understanding of the local drivers of the economy. And those economic drivers must be leveraged through intelligent transport planning, urban design, which we heard an excellent presentation on that. It was really uh, great to see the, the depth of work that goes into it. That's the same thing that's happened on Crossrail in the UK. They're diving deep into the drivers of economic activity, and they're designing into those projects value capture mechanisms that lift the revenue and the property values. Importantly, these things will not happen on their own. They need supportive public policies, and they need incentives uh, from the federal, state, local, and private sector. Now, I said earlier that I was going to show you an example of an organizational model. This is from Denver, uh, Denver, Colorado, where uh, I'm from. And this is the organizational model for the Denver Union Station Project Authority. You don't really have to see the detail behind it because I'll describe it to you. But what it's got in the orange boxes is federal, state, and local agencies are all represented on the board of directors of the authority that's making the decisions behind the project. They're all stakeholders. Going back to what Darren said, you've got to have skin in the game. So you should expect to put something in, but you should expect to get some control out of that. The other really important thing about this is the private sector on the right side. What they did in Denver was they tendered for developers 
to work alongside the Urban Renewal Authority and the Transport Authority to develop a plan for the Union Station precinct, which is about a 16 hectare precinct, former rail yards. In the center of that was a 100 year old train station that had been abandoned for about 20 years. The Union Station um, Neighborhood Authority, which is what the private sector component was called, worked with the uh, authority and with stakeholders and over two years came up with a plan that developed the Union Station and that is the station there. They put an underground bus station with, uh, uh, that connected bus rapid transit. They had heavy rail, new heavy rail, and light rail. Denver is a city with half the density of Sydney. It's got about two and a half million people in it. And the community there decided that they needed to put in a public transport uh, system after years and years of private car ownership. The first time they did this, it failed. Uh, it failed by a vote of 40 to 60 percent through a public referendum. It took the business community seven years to get it back up again by providing the sort of detail that we've been talking about this morning. And it passed 60-40. And the interesting thing apparently is if you go to Denver and you take a survey, 80 percent of the residents say they voted for it because nobody wants to admit that this project was not something that they supported. Right now, the city of Denver is building the largest transport project in the United States. It's 200 kilometers of light and heavy rail in a, in a city that didn't have any light rail 15 years ago. And it's being funded in, in, in a large part by value capture. Now, this slide here in the, in the middle column, the feasibility study, it shows that when they did the feasibility study for the, for the light rail project, they expected about 418 to 628,000 square feet of space to be developed by 2019. What actually happened is that 840,000 square feet were built a year before the project opened. And I know this because my suffering wife, my long suffering wife, goes with me every couple of years to train spot what's happening in Denver. And what we saw was buildings coming up out of the ground as they were renovating the old station and as they were building the line. And they were doing that because the business community was convinced that they were going forward with the project. They had a 20-year funding program that was committed, and they couldn't change it unless they went back to the voters. They couldn't change it with a new um, government, a change of government. It had to go back to the voters. So what we see there is that uh, let me go back, sorry about that. The various funding mechanisms that were used, I think I've left out a slide here, have I? Yeah, there we go. The funding came from federal and state grants, $100 million you can see there, property sales. Here's something that we need to think about. Why can't a public agency in Australia acquire land for a public purpose redevelop that land for a public purpose, and then sell it and make the profits available to fund the project. This is done all over the world, and this is a major source of funding that we can't use in many states of Australia. The repayment program came from the fare box, $160 million. Value capture revenue, $135 million, and that came from an uplift in the property, uh, property values, which increased the quantum but not the rate of revenue that was going into the public coffers to pay for this. And then finally, the city of Denver, I'm not suggesting you do this, Lord Mayor, guaranteed $8 million a year to meet any unfunded commitment from the project. But you know what? They'll never have to do it. Why? Because of that. They gave the business community the confidence to build alongside the railway station in advance of it opening. And the day the, the station opened, which was about a year ago, the buildings were filling up with residents and tenants. This is a project that I spoke about earlier. And the way this project worked, and this is part of a submission to the uh, transport connectivity study and value capture, uh, pardon me, value, uh, transport connectivity inquiry, 
that John Alexander is running. We helped Goodman put this together. And what we looked at was the uplift in value, the market value of land in that area, we estimated to be around $1,000 per square meter. Goodman agreed that if, we, if they could increase the density to a four to one, they would pay $500 a meter for that. And if, they increased, if it was increased to six to one, they'd pay 250 for that increment. That shows you, and this is, what, what this does is they're making more money the higher they go because there's an increment over the market value that they're willing to contribute. So when developers tell you that there is a tax that can't be absorbed by this thing, they're either not understanding how these programs work or they're not telling you the truth. So what happened? Here's the, here's the results of the funding. We looked at stamp duty over a 25-year period, and it generates 294,000, pardon me, 294 million dollars over a 25-year period. Land tax, 9 million. Property tax, 39 million. Air rights, 41 million. But the sale of the bonus floor space, or the incentive floor space, generated 429 million dollars over 25 years. More than enough to pay for all of the public improvements now, I'm not suggesting that all of that money goes to the, to the project, but I think the debate that we're not having in Australia is what is happening with revenues? What is happening with property values? Who is the beneficiary of these? And who should be sharing in that? And every time you see a guy pocket $3 million for a million dollar house because he happened to be located next to a new railway station or a speculator that does that, your ticket price just went up because $3 million, if it's a $3 million sale on a million dollar property, $2 million goes into his pocket and you got to pay for that. So I think there's a fairer way to do it and value capture is a proven way to do it without impacting the overall cost of the project if we can get the zoning controls and the development controls in place in advance so that there's downward pressure before that first sale takes place that original owner gets a fair return on his dollar, but the uplift in density is then sold at a market rate to a developer, and that difference is put into the project. It's really pretty simple. So what are the takeaways that I would leave you with today? In the first instance, long-term transport plans have to be linked with long-term funding plans. In Los Angeles, one of the cities that we visited, we met with the transport authorities, and the, the LA Metro, which covers nine million of the 20 million do, uh, people in Los Angeles, when they produce their 30-year transport plan, they have to produce a 30-year funding plan. The really interesting thing is the agency then has to go to a public referendum to get it approved. They cannot change it once it's been approved unless they go back to the public. Uh, to the public. So we need to come up with some mechanism where we lock in the funding over an extended period of time so we can access some of the 30-year bonds that Malcolm Turnbull is now talking about. That will release a flood of opportunity for projects like Adelaide Lyrell. We also need, I believe, precinct-based planning. We need to look at where those beneficiaries are located and those need to be, uh, that, that value needs to be captured. We need incentives to get developers to work alongside of us, with us, so that we have their smarts in building these communities around the transport hubs. And we need stronger urban renewal powers to give our agencies the ability to acquire ground, improve it, sell it, and use that profit to help fund the project. It's been a great morning so far. I've, uh, I've enjoyed the previous speakers, and I hope this has been useful to you, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you.